Our opening words are adapted from those of the late Norman Cousins, longtime editor of the Saturday Review. I am a single cell in a body of now seven billion cells. The body is humankind. I am a single cell whose needs are individual, but they are not unique. I am interlocked with other human beings in the consequences of our actions, our thoughts, and feelings. Therefore, I will work for human unity and human peace, for a moral order in harmony with the order of the universe. Together, we share the quest for a society of the whole equal to our needs, a society in which we need not live beneath our moral capacity and in which justice has a life of its own. We are single cells in a body of now more than seven billion cells. The body is humankind. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley. I'm Don Close, and I'm your worship associate today. This is a welcoming congregation, and we are always working on how to better welcome and care for one another. If this is your first time here, 
We're so glad you've come. And whoever you are, we welcome you in the fullness of who you are. As we begin, we want to acknowledge that this church occupies land in Huchin, the unceded territory of the Chechenyo-speaking Ohlone people. We understand that we continue to benefit from the seizure and occupation of this land. We affirm that this is deeply felt and commit our congregation to be in right relationship with indigenous communities, aligning in solidarity, supporting indigenous projects, and caring properly for the land. This morning, we'd like to welcome Dr. John Burens <laughs> back to our chancel as our guest minister. It is hard to uh, introduce him briefly because his career uh, has been so vast and his accomplishments so, so distinguished. Uh, in his ministry, he has served a number of UU congregations from Knoxville to Dallas, New York City to Needham, Massachusetts, and Carmel to San Francisco. And he served the Unitarian Universalist Association as president for eight years. He has also authored a number of books uh, elucidating universal, uh, Unitarian Universalist traditions. Among them, With Forest Church, A Chosen Faith, a UU primer, with Rebecca Parker, A House of Hope, The Promise of Progressive Religion for the 21st Century, which I recommend. And more recently, Conflagration, How the Transcendentalists Spark the American Struggle for Racial, Gender, and Social Justice. Welcome, Reverend Jurens. We are honored to have you with us today. This morning, we are assisted in our chalice lighting by Suzette Anderson Duggan. So whether you are here in person or participating at home with Suzette, let us kindle our chalice flame with these words by Joseph M. Cherry. As we gather together for worship this morning, being both near and far, we light our chalice. As we do each week, it is a symbol of our faith. May its light be a beacon of hope for the many, those who feel lost, those who feel threat, those who feel afraid and tired, those who are uncertain. May our beacon of hope help you find home, help you feel safe, give you respite, and honor your searching mind and spirit. We also pause to remind ourselves of some of the foundations of resilience. With Suzette, we light a candle of courage, a candle of acts of service, a candle of fellowship, and a candle of hope. May we find and cultivate these foundations of resilience in ourselves and in one another. Now please join us in singing our opening song, Gather the Spirit. The words will be on the screen. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy. 
Please join me in saying our covenant. Love guides this church. The quest for truth and justice is its common purpose. To give thanks, listen deeply, speak with care, honor our differences, and seek and grant forgiveness. These things we covenant with one another. One of the things that can't be taken away from me, though this is my 50th year in the ministry, is a sense of connection and concern for the rising generation. My own grandchildren, both in Boston and in San Francisco, are back to school this coming week. 
And last Sunday, I had the great honor and privilege of preaching for our co-religionists at the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Austin, Texas, where school began this past Monday. Their religious educator did a wonderful little ritual with those children who were present and those who were at home with their parents watching the service on live stream. She blessed their backpacks, first by asking them whether there weren't some things that they could bring with them as school began again from their religious community. Maybe questions. So she pulled questions out of people's ears and said, dump that curiosity into our children's backpacks. Maybe courage. So she pulled courage out of the hearts of our fellow UUs and said, there'll be new things. Don't be afraid of some change. And cast the courage into their backpacks. How about commitment? Sticking to it with your teachers. This whole lifelong learning, be committed to it. So she pulled that from the mouths of the congregation, a deep and abiding commitment to learning throughout our lives and cast that into their backpacks. This morning, I do that for my grandchildren and for all the children here in our great nation and for those who will teach them. May they carry with them in that educational endeavor that our own Horace Mann helped to make democratic and inclusive. May they carry our questions and curiosity our courage, and our commitment. So may it be. Amen.
now each of us is invited at this point in our service to retreat into that small hotel of our own hearts and minds and souls where we may find our deepest gratitude and concern and thoughts for others in this world. During this silence, you are invited to share any joys or sorrows or significant milestones of your own, either in the chat on the live stream or giving voice here. And I invite us all to use this time to keep our hearts and minds open to the cares and concerns that connect us all in this community dedicated to love and connection.
may we find in the meditations of this hour, deep within us, the balm of gratitude for the miracle of being, of being here, of being here together. May the balm also be the discovery of connection and compassion. May it be our amazement at the awesome universe beyond us. These things and more are within our unspoken prayers and thoughts as we gather here in worship. Our reading is going to uh, be in dialogue with Suzette again. It's taken from a recent novel by one of my favorite writers, sort of a, uh, well, it's like eating candy to, eat, to read Alexander McCall Smith. Some of you probably know his novels called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency, set in Botswana. They were adapted for public television. Well, Smith taught law there in Africa for a while, but he lives in Edinburgh, Scotland, where his fictitious neighbor in another series of novels is Isabel Dalhousie, who is the editor of the um, mythical Review of Practical Ethics. And in this passage from The Sweet Remnants of Summer, the latest Isabel Dalhousie novel, she is discussing with her husband, Jamie, a music teacher, just how they should respond to their older son, Charlie, who's six, and who has begun to ask questions about God, like where God lives, or whether God has to go to the bathroom. Uh, Jamie dodged that last one by changing the subject to the wolves that Charlie is always interested in. But the question of where God lives, he thought probably deserved a better answer. So he took it to his wife, Charlie's mother, the philosopher. Isabel looked away. Perhaps we should give him some very general answers. We can tell him that God is all about us and leave it at that. Well, unless we seriously want to bring him up as an atheist. I'm not sure. I would like to have a faith. I'd like to believe in a world in which there is something precious in each and every one of us. Something that has a value, a meaning, beyond our petty human concerns. Is that sentimental? Is that wishful thinking? I don't think so. And I think that sometimes we need to have a set of beliefs, myths, if you want to call them that, that allow us to feel the things I've just mentioned, that give us a language to express a sense of value. I guess I understand what you mean. Because we have to act together. If we are to combat the things that are wrong in this world, and we have to act together. And religious belief, as long as it's benevolent, enables us to do that. If we are children lost in the dark, and sometimes that's exactly what we are. Oh, I agree. It sure is dark these days. Then by joining hands with one another, we give ourselves the necessary courage to fight the battle we know we're going to have to fight. Thank you, Suzette. I think I like that passage because it reminded me of a question that was thrown at me in my very first interview for a post in ministry over 50 years ago. A lawyer on the committee, I think, hoping that he would have played gotcha, asked, is God, if any, within us or beyond us? And I immediately piped back, 
may be mostly between us, I and thou. <laughs> he laughed and must have liked that answer because I got the job. Later, when I was a candidate for the presidency of the UUA, some of you may know I was often introduced as the evangelical rabbi of liberal religion in a phrase that the seminary here in Berkeley, Star King, bestowed on me along with an honorary degree. And that led my daughter, who was then in college, to send me a card that she'd found depicting a bearded fellow wearing glasses in a very patched and well-traveled robe with a prayer shawl and a little yarmulke up where his hair had all somehow been loved off on top with the label, the Velveteen Rabbi. <laughs> and the caption, then do I get to run out and play with the real rabbis? Well, the answer I now understand is probably only in retirement, something I continue to fail at, because while ordination is for life, I've discovered that retirement is just when they stop sending you the regular paychecks. Recently, in a dialogue with a real colleague, I recalled a parable once told by the author of I and Thou, that great Jewish sage, Martin Buber. In the beginning of the modern world, Buber said, around the time of the American and French revolutions, there were three ideals that were said to walk hand in hand. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. The last, uh, we might more inclusively translate these days, is kinship. That sense that we are all sisters, brothers and others, children of one great creative ministry. The tragedy of modernity, Buber said, is that the three divided. Liberty went off to the West, to America especially, where it became mere economic and individual freedom, the freedom to exploit the earth, to ignore equality, to exploit other people, while equality went East where it suppressed liberty and through later revolutions became the equality of the gulag or of masses all waving Mao's little red book, while kinship, that sense of spiritual connection of our common humanity, went into hiding kept alive chiefly among the oppressed, only to emerge tentatively again in African Americans' struggle for human rights, behind the Iron Curtain in movements like Solidarność in Poland, and the protests that tore down the Berlin Wall and ended the Soviet Empire the one that Mr. Putin now seems to want to restore, turning millions of Ukrainians into refugees. A theologian freeing the Nazis was once asked as his ship came into New York Harbor what he thought of our Statue of Liberty. And he replied, I think she needs some demythologizing. And here's why. American liberty has far too often been atomistic individualism, a virus that today infects even religion in our land. Among its variants, is the popularity in evangelical circles now of the so-called prosperity gospel, as though what Jesus had in mind was a get-rich-quick message. Even more toxic is outright Christian nationalism, whose followers, I think, should somehow be forced to sing John Prine's great country classic, 
your flag decals won't get you into heaven anymore. It's already crowded from your dirty little war. Here in Berkeley, the late sociologist of religion, Robert Bella, in his book, Habits of the Heart, bemoaned the individualism in American spirituality and dubbed it Sheilaism, after a woman very new age oriented that he had in interviewed for the book. As though crystals could substitute for authentic justice seeking communities. Today, I think the most popular mantra in Western culture here in America is probably, I'm spiritual but not religious. And even our secularism harbors spirits of the individualistic libertarian virus, say among tech billionaires like the Elon Musks and Peter Thiels of the world, who seemingly scorn all common effort on behalf of the common good and help politically to get us a Supreme Court that overturns basic human rights, like those for women to control their own bodies. By the way, I've been in ministry now so long that I actually started before Roe v. Wade. And I remember working with the clergy consultation service on problem pregnancy and raising funds to help women travel to get needed medical treatment and scrubbing in as a hospital chaplain to minister to a woman who had managed to meet the requirements that were then necessary to justify ending a pregnancy. She had to convince three psychiatrists that she'd kill herself if she had to go through another childbirth. This Guatemalan immigrant wife who'd already seen three of her children die while she and her husband struggled to feed the remaining seven. For her and for me, her decision was a tragic one but a sacrifice, and therefore almost a sacrament. During the years I served as UUA president, I worked hard to try to reinforce the quest for the common good that authentic religion, I think, always should try to seek. I worked with women like Frances Kissling, the founder of Catholics for Choice, and Sister Joan Chittister, the articulate leader of the Benedictine Sisters here in America. Joan and I were once part of a meeting to face down the pretensions of the so-called Christian coalition and the religious right, at which a male Methodist bishop was expressing his worry about what the conservatives in his conference might say if he actually joined. And Joan memorably replied, you're not gonna get much sympathy from me, you know. I'm trying to reform the Catholic Church. which I took as a sound reminder that all authentic communities of faith contain people who defend and express individual conscience. And we must never forget that as we try to form and maintain such communities ourselves. Those meetings to pull together uh, a coalition against the religious right weren't easy, by the way. We had to contend with some rather large egos, mostly male. A rabbi right here in Berkeley comes to mind, who seemed to feel that all religious progressives should unite around him. But eventually, a strong interfaith alliance did emerge, affirming that religious freedom is vital in a democracy, that personal conscience is ultimately sacred, that no one has the right to impose their own beliefs on others, and that religious and political extremism are a threat to democracy, while religious and cultural diversity make its life creative and vibrant. That is, when individuality and community are rightly balanced and connected. 
What really first inspired me to preach on this theme this morning was reading a meditation by Sister Joan, in which she pointed out that in us, every one of us experiences a kind of push toward real community and the pull of our own individuation and self-protection. The spiritual paradox, she said, is that when we say we seek wholeness, a sense of connection with the universe, unless we practice what Howard Thurman called disciplines of the spirit in community and find again that sense of kinship of the human family as inclusive, we may well miss the mark. Or as Thomas Merton put it, we cannot find ourselves within ourselves alone, but only in others. What at the same time, before we can go out to others, we must go inward to find ourselves. If we want to grow our inner lives, we have to be constantly open not only to the craziness of the world, with its getting and spending and political shouting. We must find, as he did, time alone, away from the noise and confusion, and from the contests for power and money. Or as Harry Schofield, one of our own spiritual leaders, the longtime minister of our church in San Francisco, put it, we must learn to live by heart, as he did beginning every day with quiet meditation, greeting the day with gratitude and expectation and hope, laying aside the fear and listening to the deeper voice within, the voice that reinforces insights of the great poets and wisdom teachers, that cultivates a sense of the holiness within, beyond, but especially among, before we go out to face the world and the powers and principalities of evil in it. You know, I think sometimes that we on the progressive end of things have far too often been afraid of institutions. And it's not religious institutions that I worry about so much today. Not when 90% of Catholic women make the conscientious decision to use birth control. Not when, among evangelicals, the so-called moral majority was quickly proven to be neither. Not when the fastest group in America is the people who, when asked their religion, say none. Not when some 20% of even Roman Catholics and evangelicals don't attend church anymore. I take a, some comfort, actually, in a, well, I find an ironic story in an anecdote told me by that colleague I was dialing, dialoguing with. She's a woman, and she said that a young man came to her, raised a Unitarian Universalist, and introduced her to his bride, saying that they would be going to visit with her family, and that the wedding would be as is fairly traditional, arranged by the bride's parents. Yet when they made that visit, her parents objected to the idea that a woman would preside at the marriage. As good Christian conservatives, they said, we, we can't have that. So would you like your minister to officiate, the groom asked? Then they admitted that they didn't have one or a church community. They were freelance Christians. So my colleague presided, after all, at the home of the groom. Now, what I worry about most in our polarized, disconnected, 
moralizing and often violent rhetoric in the culture today is that underneath it all, having cast out or tried to cast out demons like sexism, racism, classism, nationalism, we have emptied the American soul and made it hospitable to a demon worse than the others. What social critic Christopher Lash named back in the 1970s as a culture of narcissism. Its most toxic manifestation, of course, being the election to the highest office in the land of the narcissist in chief, who continues to try to polarize and divide. The introduction of that term reminds me of an experience that I once had near the Christmas shopping season in a glitzy shopping mall. I was meditating on how even our annual consumerist potlatch has become tainted with sneaky forms of competitiveness and self-congratulations when I saw a young man, a teenager, earbuds in, bopping along, no packages in his hand, wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with the memorable motto, only you can prevent narcissism. <laughs> to which I must say, no, actually only you and you and you and I together can prevent this culture in which we live and move and have our being from falling into the cultural, spiritual, political abyss any further. To paraphrase something that Martin Buber also said, there is no solution to be found in the lives of isolated individuals. Although one may pray that the light of wisdom and the warmth of compassion and the fire of commitment can be rekindled in their souls when the world seems dark and cold. No, the only solution is to be found in communities that live in the spirit of the prophets and the teachers, not pretending to have all the answers, but at least asking the questions of how do we go about serving greater justice, loving compassion and mercy, and walking more humbly together. Because as another great preacher put it, individuals who get entirely wrapped up in themselves become very small packages. And to be sure, each of us has and deserves a unique and precious individual personality. Here, in this congregation and others like it. We affirm that explicitly as a basic principle of the free faith we share. We don't ask that you be anything or anyone but yourself, or that you park your doubts at the door but only that you come here striving to be a better, deeper, more connected self. For the life we share, after all, is just a chance to grow a soul, which can only be done in authentic and diverse community. As we strive and persist in striving, to be and to form beloved community, which we want to see unfold in the world around us as well. In so doing, friends, let us never forget that it is already present, whenever and wherever, like today, 
we reaffirm our love for life itself, for the gift of being, the unmerited beauty of being, for its creative mystery with all of our heart and mind and soul, and then go forth to try to help one another truly love our neighbors as ourselves. I say to you, as a historian now, never before in American history has our culture more desperately needed the witness and the work of spiritual communities such as this one. Therefore, I charge each and every one of you to reach out and reach a lonely soul and invite them here. For the rebuilding of the American soul must begin with our efforts to reconnect those single cells into a body, a spiritual body, that is worthy of the name democracy. May we bear witness to our faithfulness to it in our own lives and never cease to invite others to join us in spreading its good news. First by our living example and when necessary using words and story. So may it be. Amen. Thank you. We really need some moments to absorb that. But at this point in our service, we invite you to make an offering. With our offering, each of us has the opportunity to recommit to making UUCB a strong and vibrant community. For now, we're conducting the offering in the sanctuary without passing the plate. Instead, you can give electronically or you can take a donation uh, envelope to the back of the pew in front of you and place it in the donation box uh, beside the fountain in the atrium. We support our wonderful good neighbor organizations through our plate offering. Each week, half our plate offering is shared with a good neighbor organization recommended by our Social Justice Council. We're grateful for you, to you for continuing to practice generosity with our good neighbors through these hard times. Our good neighbor organization for this month is No More Tears. No More Tears is a violence and crime prevention program founded in 2002 by men incarcerated at San Quentin and concerned citizens together seeking to remedy the rise of violent crime in their communities and reduce the recidivism rate of returning citizens. No More Tears recognizes the unique perspective of former perpetrators and values their ability to bring solutions to their communities. Offerings of any kind, of any value, are always received with gratitude. Thank you.
Please join me in dedicating our offering. We dedicate our offering and ourselves to the mission of this congregation, to create a loving community, inspire spiritual growth, and encourage lives of integrity, joy, and service. So this morning, Reverend Michelle is going to do our announcements. Thank you, Don. Don't you just love announcements? And there are a lot of them to love today, just a heads up. So first, I want to give a huge shout out to the volunteers who've been working with the Our Whole Lives program this weekend. Our Whole Lives is sexuality education that we, they, both Unitarian Universalist and United Church of Christ do. And this weekend, UUCB hosted training for our facilitators for both mostly folks from the West Coast, but we have an East Coaster that came also. And it took the work of 27 volunteers to help support this, led by the amazing, unflapp unflappable Alice Lemieux. So just a great big thank you and shout out to them. And that's where I've been all weekend also. I've been being trained in that program. So that's why you got to hear the fabulous Reverend John this morning. Tomorrow, there is something super exciting happening. Have y'all heard about like conversations with the Kensington Fire Department? Yes, we will for the next two years be hosting the Kensington Fire Department in our North parking lot while their main building is undergoing retrofitting and they're starting the work on the space tomorrow. So just a heads up when you start to see that we're gonna be I think the siting and stuff has happened. There's now going to be electrical and pipes and stuff for the firefighters and the trucks, and it's all going to start appearing. And we'll have some social events with them too, so that'll be going on. And as there's been some conversation about, and we've been working on since this past spring, conversations about the future of UUCB's retreat property in Sonoma County, Freestone. So starting next Sunday after the service, we're going to be, I will be hosting uh, some sharing and listening sessions, both after the worship services and there will be some evening time ones during the week. Look for details in the week ahead about that, as well as upcoming dates for problem solving sessions, for being able to continue talking about and sharing about the variety of facts and perspectives and feelings about the Freestone property coming up to a vote, congregational vote on October 23rd. And thank you to the 71 UUCB members who have so far taken our trust survey, which is some interim work that I've been working on with you. If there's any members who need a paper version, they're in the office, and I hope to have information to share about that soon. 
Don't worry, I'm not done yet. I told you we have a lot of announcements to love today. Lost and found, it's in the social hall, it's going away, this is your last chance. Really, it is. Some things have been there for years. All right, there was a work party scheduled for this Saturday. They decided to move it to the following Saturday. And the motto is work hard and party hard. I hear there'll be music. I hear there'll be food. I hear there'll be fun. Sign up board in the atrium or email Lynn Cahoon. And speaking of Lynn Cahoon, who's also fabulous, there's so many fabulous people here. She puts together these super cards, which are great big cards with lots of names on them sent to UUCB folks who are in need or have been going through something hard. We have a bunch of them in the atrium. Please stop by and sign, even if you don't know that person. It is wonderful to get one of those super cards filled with names and even see names you don't know. So please stop by and sign them. Lynn, we've got three or four today. Five. Five. Okay, lots of signing. They're in the, they're in the atrium. All right, Wednesday, August 31st, will be a Winding the Circle sharing session. The first two were so successful, there's going to be another one, but space is limited, so you've got to register more in the week ahead on that. And then Thursdays, starting September the 1st, which if you're following, that's the day after the Winding the Circle session. Come on, about to start a church here. we got lots going on. Enjoy learning Javanese gamelan music. All ages, all skill levels, from very skilled to what, what are we talking about? Everybody's welcome. And this opportunity is unique. I've actually not heard about it in other UU congregations. This is a UUCB unique activity to learn, play, discuss, and collaborate while experiencing firsthand the meditative and transcendent beauty of Javanese gamelan. Daniel Schmidt and Tom Tripp are the leaders of it. Look for their contact information in the week ahead. <sighs> Got all that? Got all that? Much better. All right, let's join in singing, Be That Guide. Please rise and body your own spirit. The words will be on screen. Bless us as gratitude for the gift of being, as connection and com compassion in community, and as people who feel the awe and wonder of both earth and the stars beyond. Go indeed in peace and be the peace you wish to see. Amen.
many people have been concerned about climate change and when i heard that when i heard that the bill called the inflation reduction act was passed i felt a glimmer of hope and so i wrote this song and i felt so much gratitude for communities like this that i think made it possible <laughs> Steady on, say. 